Bienvenidos a una nueva entrevista de la serie Diálogos con Jorge Gestoso rumbo a Claxo 2018, el primer foro mundial del pensamiento crítico que se realizará en Buenos Aires, Argentina, en el mes de noviembre. Una serie en la cual estamos entrevistando a personalidades a nivel mundial. Y hoy tenemos el honor que nos acompañe desde Suecia el doctor en Sociología y profesor emérito de la Universidad de Cambridge en el Reino Unido, Goran Thornburn. Professor Thornborn, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you. Professor Thornborn, in your book, Killing Fields of Inequality, you reach the conclusion that inequality kills. Why? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, in inequality has to be seen as a violation of human dignity. It's something much more than... than uh, an unequal distribution of income or wealth. It's a denial of the possibility uh, for every human being to uh, realize her or his capability. And uh, the denial of this capability, this is the background, I mean, to why inequality kills. Now, how does it, how does it do that? Uh, well, there are several ways, uh, uh, several channels uh, from inequality to uh, uh, death. One of them uh, starts already in the uh, uh, before your birth, in in uh, uh, your fetal development, uh, for reasons which are still uh, not well understood. Uh, there is a consistent pattern all over the world that uh, poor women and working class women uh, and uh, women, uh, women uh, who are living under social stress and during their pregnancy tend to um, deliver uh, uh, low weight babies. Uh, or there is a tendency for it, not doesn't hold for everybody, of course, but there is a tendency that uh, uh, you can uh, have your life shortened and your health impaired um, and your risk for uh, diseases uh, developed already before you're born. Uh, then in your uh, uh, adult life uh, there is the, the uh, effect on your health and ultimately even on your uh, uh, survival uh, the effect of, of stress hormones of various kinds uh, and thirdly uh, even in rich countries even in well-organized countries like Sweden uh, health care and particularly health, regular health checks which are very important for your longevity uh, has a kind of deterrent cost to many uh, low-income people. And finally there is the, uh, the, um, the effects of despair, of humiliation, sense of hopelessness and the, the way in which many people try to cope with that with the help of uh, nicotine, with the help of alcohol, or in the United States with the uh, help of uh, uh, opioids or pain uh, relievers. And the effect of this is absolutely amazing. Uh, in the United States, uh, for instance, I mean, the, uh, the, there has now, throughout this century so far, uh, been a regular increase in the mortality of middle-aged white non-Hispanic Americans, uh, largely due to their uh, attempt at coping with the hopeless situation, increasing uh, despair with, the, with uh, the help of the opioids. And this has now reached such a uh, level that the total life expectancy in the United States is going down slightly. Or to take a more, even more dramatic example, the, um, the great British epidemiologist Sir Michael Marmot 
has estimated that the restoration of capitalism in the former Soviet Union in the course of the 1990s caused 4 million extra deaths. 4 million extra deaths in the former Soviet Union. And uh, that was largely due to um, the effects of mass drastic mass unemployment, impoverishment, uh, and, and, and despair and hopelessness on a uh, large part of the working class population and um, uh, their ways of trying to cope with it. So that's... Uh, 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 and and uh, we know, I mean, that... Uh, uh, and we are studying it in, in, in many countries, in, in, in cities, for instance, I mean, how life expectancy uh, is very different from between rich and poor neighborhoods. Uh, the difference in, in life expectancy between the London borough, boroughs, for instance, is uh, around nine years. So in the poorer boroughs, I mean, people live nine years, have a nine year shorter life than uh, the wealthy people of uh, Chelsea and Kensington. And it's interesting to notice that this uh, difference within the single city of London is the same as the distance in longevity between the United Kingdom and Guatemala. And, and Professor, also in your other book, another of your books that you called it The Ideology of Power and the Power of Ideology, you also mentioned that there are other forms of inequality that has an effect, you say, detrimental effect on individuals. What are you talking about? Well, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, three kinds of, of, of inequality, uh, of uh, vital inequality, which is the inequality with respect to health and, and uh, longevity, um, and existential inequality, which has to do with whether you are treated with uh, respect and recognition, or whether you are ignored, you are humiliated, uh, you have no personal autonomy. This is something, I mean, we, we notice in uh, relations between men and women in many cultures, between ethnic groups, between dominant and, and dominated religious groups, uh, etc. And thirdly, you have a, a resource inequality, which is the kind of inequality uh, most people think about. Uh, firstly, I mean, uh, the resources you have, the income, the uh, wealth, uh, the social contacts, and, and uh, for that matter, also the power uh, you have. And these different kinds of inequalities, they de develop at different speed and, and in different, sometimes in different directions. We have, for instance, I mean, in the recent decades, uh, in, in uh, most parts of the world, an increase of economic inequality. And uh, in the, but in, the, in uh, some parts of the world, vital inequality has declined. And in many countries, most countries of the world, existential inequality, particularly inequality between men and women, has declined uh, substantially. So it's very important, I mean, to have this kind of multidimensional uh, perspective on inequality. But you also asked me about my book, uh, uh, The Ideology of Power and the Power of Ideology, uh, which is, of course, also related, I mean, to, um, to inequality. Um, and um, for uh, an understanding of power and the operation of power, uh, I think an analysis of ideology is very important. That was, that's why I, I wrote that book uh, quite some time ago, but I'm still very proud of it, I must say. And um, there were, uh, there were four, four, new, four new things I wanted to bring to the uh, discussion, I mean, of uh, ideology in, in the world. One was a dialectic perspective, 
uh, which comes out of, if you think of the, the meaning of the word subject, which uh, uh, is on the one hand, I mean, you are a subject of your actions, a sovereign subject, uh, but you are also, uh, you can, subject also means the subject of a prince or a king or something, the king and his subjects, his subordinates. And uh, this uh, uh, captures, I mean, the, uh, one of the most important essences of, of the operation of an ideology, which is uh, um, both to, to, uh, uh, to dominate and to qualify people for their roles and, uh, and so on. And the, the uh, ideological change uh, very often, I mean, happens through the uh, new conditions have created uh, acute tensions by this, by the uh, between the element of subjection and the element of qualification in ideology. The second thing I wanted to add was to say that ideology is not a possession, something you have. Uh, it's something. It's a process. And it's something which speaks to you, and you listen to it. And uh, it um, it operates in in uh, uh, competition uh, with uh, other uh, uh, ideologies. So there is a, a, a uh, all all the time uh, uh, there is a, an ongoing. Uh, uh, competition between uh, uh, ideologies trying to speak to you, because this is very uh, varies very much between, say, democratic and open societies and countries and a more closed one. But but it, it in principle it happens everywhere. Then, as a um, as a Marxist, I, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, say something about the material determination of ideology. And I think that's also uh, something uh, which shouldn't be evaded. I mean, uh, many Marxists have been very shy of trying to uh, uh, get away from uh, too deterministic and too uh, clumsy formulations. And I would argue that in this ever ongoing competition between different ideologies, they all operate in what I call a, a matrix of affirmation and sanctions. That an ideology, an ideological message, uh, to be accepted, it has to find some something in the perceived reality which affirms it, and uh, something which uh, sanctions you if you uh, don't believe in the uh, in this ideology um, and finally I, I wanted to uh, go into uh, the uh, uh, deeper mechanism for ideological domination getting out of the uh, simple dichotomy between force and consent or coercion and consent and uh, looking at how ideology uh, or ideological domination operates. And I, I think one can say that there are three stages of an ideological argument. The first one is to deny that something exists. It, it's an argument about what, what exists and what doesn't exist. For instance, inequality or serious inequality doesn't exist. Um, the second stage is, oh, okay, I mean, uh, you uh, it's impossible to deny, as uh, has happened now in recent years after the financial crash in, in 2008, that inequality is actually increasing in the world, is accelerating. Uh, but then uh, you have the, uh, if you want to preserve inequality, you have another card to play. You can say uh, uh, that well, it's, it's not so bad, uh, really, sort of, I mean, increasing inequality and so on. I mean, so it's, it's an argument about what, what is good or bad. 
And thirdly, the final, the decisive argument in many ideological conflicts is, okay, uh, uh, inequality exists and it's bad, but it's impossible to do something about it. So you have these stages of arguments about what is, what is good and uh, what is possible. And you have different ways in which people uh, adjust, I mean, to this kind of messages from uh, uh, accommodation to fear and resignation uh, and so on. Uh, and um, I think this, this was uh, one of the uh, most stimulating theoretical books I've written. I've written uh, others and empirical studies. Uh, which I'm also very proud of, but that was that was a theoretical argument, which I think still holds to some large extent. Professor, tell us how Europe is doing. Well, Europe is not doing very well, uh, um, and certainly uh, uh, not in terms of uh, of, um, of inequality, which is increasing uh, in uh, virtually every. Uh, country in uh, in Europe, and uh, its politics is uh, in becoming increasingly xenophobic and and uh, even racist. And and uh, we have a, a a revival of the uh, religious fanaticism of the Crusades. Uh, in, in Islamophobia um, and uh, there is also as I guess you have noticed I mean the uh, uh, the, the, the problems with the uh, Britain wanted to wanting to leave the European Union so the old the old enthusiasm about the European Union and an ever closer union among the European peoples uh, uh, is now even officially gone. Um, on the other hand, I mean, the European Union is not going to fall apart, I think, or, or to disappear. I mean, it has a, a great capacity of muddling through uh, and uh, finding some kind of uh, temporary solution uh, uh, at uh, one uh, minute before midnight. And, and there is also something which perhaps, I mean, should be stressed, uh, which is that even though uh, inequality in, in Europe has been uh, increasing since around 1980, and in my country, in Sweden, has uh, increased uh, very rapidly and very dramatically, Europe remains the least inequal, uh, unequal uh, continent uh, on Earth, um, particularly with respect to to economic uh, inequality, but also to um, uh, gender inequality. Uh, what is one? What is worrying is that the uh, health gap and the um, uh, uh, life expectancy gap between the uh, uh, rich and the poor classes. Uh, is continuously increasing in, in uh, I think, every single European country, at least every country for which we have reliable uh, uh, data. Um, the only positive thing uh, uh, about inequality in Europe is, is that uh, there has been a, a uh, there have been great advances in existential issues of, of gender and sexual inequality in, in the last decades. And tell us, what, what, how do you see the United States under the presidency of Donald Trump? Well, <laughs> I, I sometimes find it quite hilarious uh, uh, how, I mean, the the uh, both the European the European uh, liberals and social democrats and conservatives uh, who have been formed I mean by the Cold War and and, and uh, have been trained 
to look up to the United States and to say yes sir to everything coming out uh, of Washington. Uh, how bewildered and confused they, they have become. Um, and I notice that the same uh, reaction uh, I have when I uh, look at the uh, uh, domestic liberals of the United States. I mean, the, the old Cold War hawks, I mean, who uh, always want to have uh, at least a big Cold War going on and, and uh, uh, a few smaller hot wars going on. And, and Trump is sort of breaking that that uh, 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 that that pattern and, and could be, it's certainly very disturbing I mean for the European uh, uh, political elite then of course I mean more seriously uh, 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 one has reason to be worried I mean the uh, uh, Trump's uh, acting in, in uh, relation to Iran I mean could could start a, a conflagration of the whole Middle Eastern region. But it has to be admitted, I mean, that we, it, it looked very dangerous uh, some months ago. Uh, uh, Trump was, was, fre or, uh, was threatening North Korea with uh, total annihilation. And, and now he, he has made a deal, I mean, with the, uh, with the North Koreans. Um, and this again, I mean, means uh, that uh, a great problem, I mean, for NATO and the uh, and and the uh, uh, NATO politicians and the NATO ideologies, because they they don't really know, I mean, what to say, because it's is unpredictable. So on. I mean, one day Trump says one thing, and the other day he says the opposite, and and these people who are uh, accustomed, I mean, to follow uh, the the lead of the United States. Are, are really, uh, really confused. Uh, Professor, last question. How do you see Latin America? Well, uh, I have been uh, uh, studying Latin America uh, uh, quite a lot over the years, and um, I'm many friends there, and uh, so I've uh, followed it with great concern. I was, like uh, uh, many other people, very um, how to say, uh, I found uh, the, uh, what the Cipal called uh, La Hora de, de la Igualdad in, in America Latina, uh, very encouraging. Uh, at the time when, when economic inequality was rising in North America and in, uh, uh, and in Europe, uh, and for that matter in most of Asia, uh, he was a, 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 a continent in which it was uh, declining. And that was the, the, uh, the happy decade from around 2002 to 2012, 13 or something. Um, now, uh, uh, that period has, has stopped now, as, as you know very well. Um, and when, when one looks back, I mean, one has to, to think of the, the fact that in, in most countries, the uh, rather uh, consistent and general uh, effort at reducing economic inequality, in, in many cases, just uh, meant a return to the inequality before the military dictatorships in Brazil, in Chile, and in Argentina and Uruguay. It didn't really uh, go much further. I think one can say, I mean, that one of the, uh, the legacies of the oppressive regimes in, in, in Latin America has on the one hand, I mean, been a, uh, to produce a, a pervasive culture of mistrust, fear and violence. And secondly, I mean, to have uh, uh, created uh, dark periods of social degradation, uh, which the periods of democracy, of progressive democracy, has uh, uh, had to uh, redress, and then the, the, the process uh, uh, changes uh, again. 
uh, on the other hand, uh, there is of course one bright spot in 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 Mexico today, and that is uh, Morena in 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 Mexico and, and Andres Manuel López Obrador, uh, which promises. I mean, I think to be a um, a government of, of of real social transformation. And uh, professor, before to before to to go, uh, your advice your recommendation, your comments about people who are thinking to attend this Claxo event in Argentina in November. What do you have to say to them? Well, first of all, I would like to say, I mean, that Claxo is a great institution which doesn't have any real equivalent on any uh, uh, continent. So uh, uh, Latin American social scientists, social scholars, I mean, should be very proud of it. And um, uh, Latin American social science has a, uh, of, of old, I mean, a strong social commitment. And I hope that that commitment will be resilient and resistant in these dark times which many countries of, of uh, uh, South and Central America are now uh, going through. Then I also hope that the, um, the social commitment will be combined with uh, new advances uh, in, uh, um, of big and bold uh, social scholarship. And I have uh, uh, four uh, things I, I, I would just like to mention, just as an example, I mean, not, uh, not to sort of uh, give any uh, specific advice. But I do think uh, uh, not only Latin America but uh, the world uh, would be uh, uh, very interested in uh, uh, four kind of major uh, uh, topics of, of uh, big large-scale collective investigations which Claxo I mean, can, can organize. Uh, one of them uh, is to explain why has no country in Latin America managed to develop a comprehensive and egalitarian welfare state. Despite several attempts, um, uh, many attempts at, at different times, what, what stopped these attempts in Uruguay, in Argentina, in uh, uh, Mexico of the Revolution, the period of Cardenas, etc., and so on, and, and, and the, the effort of, of uh, Lula and Dilma in, in Brazil. But that, that, that's one question which I think uh, not only Latin Americans would be interested in, but the, the whole world. The second one is perhaps a bit more specific, but I, I know it, it has a, a certain particular interest in Latin America. And that's the, to explain the dynamics of a new phenomenon in Latin America, which is the, uh, a successful civilian right-wing political mobilization. You've seen, I mean, for the first time in Argentine history, uh, the, the, the right could win an honest election, which as far as I know has never happened before. And there was this enormous right-wing mobilization which uh, brought down Dilma and, and got all these corrupt uh, parliamentarians, I mean, to impeach her, the least corrupt of them all. So why has this uh, right-wing mobilization suddenly become possible in Latin America? And what sustains it and what can stop it? Why was it stopped in, in Mexico? Then I think there are two questions of the future which might be very uh, important uh, uh, both uh, for Latin Americans and for uh, uh, non-Latin American colleagues uh, uh, to, to know about. One is the, the um, investigations at the interface of social science and biomedicine, of the interaction of biomedical processes and, and social conditions in, in, in producing and determining 
uh, life conditions, life expectancy, health and so on. I mean, all this uh, uh, field, which is one of the most uh, rapidly progressing uh, research frontiers in, in, in the world, and where we still haven't uh, seen that much coming out of Latin America, but where there is an enormous potential uh, uh, among Latin American scholarship to do it. And the, uh, the uh, other uh, example about the, the, the future, which I think we all have to go through and think about very seriously, and what we are beginning to do here in, in, in Sweden now, and that is what uh, will be the social consequences for Latin America of the digital revolution, which is now just beginning with uh, robotics, artificial learning, the new surveillance uh, techniques and so on. How is this or the, the gig economy or the economia de plataformas, uh, as you say in Spanish, uh, is there any way in which this kind of enormous technological change can be um, socially regulated and uh, uh, be of, of benefit to all humankind? Or do we have to, to uh, uh, look forward to ever increasing inequality in the world? Professor Goran Thornborn, thanks very much for joining us and uh, I look forward to seeing you in Buenos Aires in November. Thank you. I'm looking forward to going to Buenos Aires. <laughs>